welcome to uh, CT News Junkie's first public policy forum. In this series, we'll be addressing important challenges facing Connecticut. We're excited about being able to offer our subscribers a more comprehensive view of what's happening at the state capitol because we believe government should be accessible and easy to understand. I, I say that knowing that it's neither sometimes, and that's why we're having these forums. And today's discussion will focus on the state budget. However, we would first like to thank our host, Reset, the Social Enterprise Trust, and Hartford's original co-working space. The mission here is to advance the social enterprise sector and help entrepreneurs get their businesses running. Their strategic goals are to be go-to place for impact entrepreneurs to make Hartford the impact city and to make Connecticut the social enterprise state. And also thank you to our presenting sponsor today, Dominion Energy, owner and operator of Millstone Power Station in Waterford, New England's largest nuclear facility. They generate the largest share of Connecticut's electricity every day at 2,100 megawatts, more than half. Dominion Energy is one of the nation's largest producers and transporters of energy and employs 21,000 people nationwide with a commitment to hiring at least one military veteran for every new five, five new hires. Dominion sponsorship not only made today's event possible, but the sponsorship also provides support to CT News Junkie's mission of public service journalism at the state capitol. If you are not a subscriber and would like to be, let us know before you leave and we'll sign you up. Um, and here we go. So Connecticut state budget funds vital services, but could be at risk from significant future deficits. Calls for fiscal discipline are growing as the cost of past promises are coming due. Additional challenges facing the new administration include growing uncertainty at the federal level, significant volatility in financial markets, and the growing likelihood of a recession. Connecticut ranks 43rd among states in economic growth behind both the US and New England averages with consistently higher unemployment um, than across the nation. I would like to thank our state comptroller, Kevin Limbo, Katie Roy, executive director of the Connecticut State uh, School Finance Project, and Deputy Minority Leader Vincent Candelora for joining us. We're gonna have a 45 minute discussion and then I'm going to open it up to audience questions. Um, Ellen has no cards and pens, so please write your question down and we'll be asking those at the end. Um, I also wanted to note that we did ask the new Office of Policy and Management Secretary, Melissa McCall, to participate in the discussion, but she declined, um, mostly because she's busy putting together her own budget staff and the budget itself. Um, which is coming due in mid-February. Um, so I wanted to start the discussion with something that Governor Ned Lamont said during his first speech as governor. He said, I refuse to invest any time in the blame game of who's responsible for this crisis. It's real, it's here, it's time to confront it head on, and please don't tell me you've done your share and that it's somebody else's turn. It's all of our turns. Fix the budget, invest in the future, and nothing can stop us. So, State Comptroller Kevin Love, if you had to assign blame for our current budget crisis, what would it be? Who <laughs> <laughs> to blame? Who to blame? Uh, so, look, I, I'm going to agree with the new governor and say that a blame game without new answers is just an exercise to like, make us feel better. Um, it, it doesn't really move the ball, it doesn't uh, take us forward at all. Um, but I think there's two groups when you talk about like who to blame. Like there's ones who don't want to talk about how we got here, which is a different question than who to blame. Okay. How we got here is very important because that's the only way we can figure out like how do we make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, but just punishing people in the public square and engaging in the blame game, I don't know that it, it moves us uh, forward at all. So look, history matters, um, if only for its instructive value. Uh, what I think back to the mid-90s, or I look at the history of the mid-90s, and I look at the pension fund in particular, in a time of record surpluses, and deals were made that shorted payments to the pension fund in a way that set that thing off kilter and took what was a, by today's standards, a relatively uh, modest uh, deficit in the pension fund uh, to one that is hundreds of millions more than it was on that very day. So okay, we know we got there because people agreed to do a hinky thing, uh, not in a public way, and like here we are. And there were multiple opportunities over the years to correct the hinky thing, um, and that didn't happen, so here it is. Um, so what did we learn? We learned that by downplaying, by ignoring, by hiding, by doing anything uh, that doesn't help you solve uh, the problem that's in 
before you, you just make it worse and, and it obviously doesn't go away. But we supposedly learned that as children, and, and I'm not sure like that always <coughs> uh, sticks. Um, the governor is correct. Uh, so we need to focus on, uh, focus productively um, on what happens now. Uh, and that is how do we make our best effort to keep the commitments that the state has made? How do we uh, make the full payments uh, to the pension fund? How do we wrangle the teacher's retirement system that should be on top of everyone's mind uh, now? or for the last 10 years or in the next two, um, and get those, if you can't get out from under a big number, um, especially one that's growing, uh, the next best thing is to make it flat and predictable because at least you hope growth solves some of that. So uh, there's hard conversations uh, that need to happen and I don't think anyone should hear that as hard conversations which means someone's gonna lose something necessarily. I don't know the answer to that. But what I do know is that those hard conversations about how do we deal with the bond covenant in the teacher's retirement system, how do we uh, get to a $2 billion payment in the state employee retirement system every year until 2032 when relief comes. Um, those are the hard conversations as they crowd out other important spending that are reflections of our values as people. Um, those are the things that are getting uh, crowded out. And so, Katie, your organization held a day-long event on understanding Connecticut's pension crisis, which is how we got here. Um, and so what has that meant for education funding in Connecticut? So when we talk about the budget, there are a lot of big numbers in the budget in the billions. Uh, most of us can't conceive of billions of dollars. Most of us don't have billions of dollars. Um, we spend billions of dollars on education every year. So I think it's a lot easier to think about the budget and the role of education funding versus our fixed costs as a pie. So if we think of the entire state budget as a pie, at this point, about half of that pie is taken up by fixed costs, including our long-term pension debts. That means that we only have half of the pie left for everything else that government does. And of that half of a pie that we have remaining, a third of that pie is education funding. Everything else in that pie is everything from highways to human services. So as that fixed portion of the pie grows, right, that half that is made up of costs that are paying for things that happened in the past grows, that other half of the pie shrinks, meaning that there is less funding available for everything else the state does, including education. And because education funding makes up such a significant portion of the remaining half of that pie, uh, as that half of the pie shrinks, uh, those costs begin to get crowded out. So what we have seen happen um, over the last few years, particularly as those fixed cost payments have really escalated, is that there is less money available for education funding, as well as all of the other important services that the state provides to its citizens, which is causing real challenges in how we think about funding our public schools across the state. So, Representative Candelora, can Connecticut get out from under this pension mess, which is eating up the larger portion of our fixed costs, uh, as Katie just said, without asking the labor unions for more concessions? So, I mean, that's that's a great question, and, and certainly um, a philosophical one and a hot political one. Um, <laughs> but I think, go for it. I am going to go for it. <laughs> so, and I, I think, um, you know, Katie Roy points out the issue, the quandary that we're in, because that pie is increasing the fixed costs, um, which is in part our CBAC agreement. And Controller Lembo um, importantly points out there was deals made back in the 90s um, that many of us didn't know about that have come to hurt us in the future. I remember when I first entered the legislature in, in 2007, and it was soon after when the recession hit in 08 that legislators started to realize that under the CBAC agreement, um, leadership in the governor's office was able to contractually reduce the amount of money being paid into the pension funds. So when the budgets were being crafted, if they needed more money, they could underfund the pensions, which is what went on for quite a few years without many legislators even knowing. Um, and what was interesting about that is, I mean, I think transparency is important in the process. And we've done a lot now to sort of um, make it more clear and more transparent. It was, it's odd to me that we have these long-term contracts that go out 20 years. When that CBAC agreement was renegotiated, you know, it's put, put out into the future, 2027, as opposed to 
doing short-term contracts, which we see at the municipal level. Um, and I think they get into less trouble because when they negotiate their contracts, they get into a room, if they don't agree, it goes to arbitration. The deals tend to be every three years. In the state of Connecticut, that doesn't necessarily happen. So we've had some contracts that go on 20 years, um, and we just can't look out that far, and now it's getting us into trouble. And we're seeing that we need to revisit these contracts every year. And the unions say, that's not fair. You made a promise. You're breaking your promise. Well, in reality, is it's unrealistic to enter into 20-year agreements, um, especially with the volatility that we're all seeing. So I do feel that, yes, we need to bring the unions back to the table and have a conversation because all these deals that have been created just aren't realistic. Um, we've talked about looking at you know, tweaking the uh, uh, overtime. Uh, and not have it factored into your pension. Uh, that's a savings that the state could, could obtain. And of course it's controversial and, and people will say, well, I was entitled to that benefit. But because of the changing nature um, of, of our budget, you know, those conversations <coughs> need to be had because the state can't afford it. Um, and I think one of the most important measures that we put in this last, the bipartisan budget negotiations was going forward now, contracts need to be limited to four years, number one. So the state can no longer enter into these long-term deals that affect future legislatures down the road. And number two, um, to require that these contracts go to a vote of the General Assembly. We finally voted on a CBAC agreement about two years ago. That was the first time in about 40 years that a contract had ever been voted on in the state of Connecticut by the legislature. Um, that's a crazy process. And I think it's important for us to you know, also have those documents and know what you're voting on. I served on the Appropriations Committee. We used to vote on summaries. We never saw the contracts unless you specifically asked for them. Um, so those reforms will go a long way. But in short, I do believe, given where we are as an economy and just looking at our revenues, we need the unions to come back to the table and have that broad conversation. So Comptroller Lumbo, what do you believe is the correct balance of spending and revenues? What does that look like? Is there a way for Governor Lamont um, to get out of the crisis without raising taxes, tapping the rainy day fund, or asking labor for more concessions? So again, encouraging that um, the statement uh, opening day was everything is on the table. Right? So everything's on the table, but you know that gets said a lot. Um, so what does that really mean? So I think by definition, it means all the things that you just mentioned. I don't think there is a way out of there without looking at everything. We have to look at it all. I will say- Maybe the rainy day fund? Uh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, <laughs> I was a little surprised uh, during the election cycle um, that at least two out of the three gubernatorial candidates seemed to think about the rainy day fund as a revenue source. Like they immediately thought they were going to tap into that as a revenue source to feed their budget plan. That's not why that's there. That's there for, as a last resort, it's there at the end of the year or when you hit a, a significant economic downturn. Um, the whole reason we, we put money away is so, so we can weather the next economic storm when it occurs. So now when I get texts from legislators or others saying, what's the balance in the rainy day fund? I'm like, <laughs> why? <laughs> I'm happy to tell you that it will be about $2 billion at the end of this uh, fiscal year if things keep going the way they're going. But it's going to take every dollar of that to get through the next economic downturn that is inevitably coming. So wouldn't it be better to sort of be disciplined about that so that when we hit the skids really again, you'll have the resources to not cut everything, particularly those safety net programs and the things that people rely on for food or for health care, the things that we know uh, that they need. So everything's got to be on the table. Um, I think you know, to, to touch on something that Representative Campbell Laura said, um, uh, you know, I think uh, we'll see how it goes with the conversation with labor and the new governor. Um, when I look at changes to the retirement system that have been negotiated particularly, I'm not gonna go down the rabbit hole, I promise, but tier three and now tier four, these are very different things than tier one, both from a cost perspective and from accrual benefits perspective and from a burden on the state. Really, it's the tier one piece, you know, the oldest retirees of whom only a couple are actually, uh, a couple hundred I think are actually still working right now, that had a very different benefit design that by today's standards you know, raises affordability questions. 
um, but always takes us back to, well, if we had just done what we were supposed to do, this wouldn't have happened. So whose fault is this, and how do you sort of get from where you are? So can you, knowing that, knowing that it is the previous generation um, that has contributed to this problem, can, should you go back and ask retirees well, for, this is for where some of, I mean, I know they have a property right to that. Right, so if we can think about this, and I and tried to mention this at the, the budget of the uh, pension forum that, that Katie Roy and her group did with the League of Women Voters, but it, you know, I'll often say, well, it's just numbers, right? When I'm putting out budget surplus or deficit numbers, it's just math, it's just math. Um, in this case, it's not just math. It's grandmas and grandpas and dads and moms who have a budget that's fixed and say, okay, this is what I can expect from the state, from my pension every month. And that's how I keep myself in my house and fed and clothed and all of those things. That's a very different question than saying, okay, in the future, when you retire, this is what this is going to look like. Can a conversation occur around the calculation of COLA with the, with the retired population? Yes. Um, but we have to be really clear about what that, what that means. Um, those fixes have already been put in place in the new uh, pension agreements. The spiking of overtime has been corrected. The idea of a hybrid pension plan that's more 401k on the front end and a pension plan on the back end uh, has been done in tier four. So those things have all been done. And in fact, the normal cost, and I'll stop after this, I promise, the normal cost of the pension. So essentially, you know, what percentage of payroll does it take to sort of pay for this pension system? In the tier four, it's 7%, roughly 6, 8, I think. Let's call it 7 just for round numbers. 7% normal cost, so 7% of payroll that has to be set aside. Of that 7%, the employee pays 5%, the state pays 2 So that has completely flipped from what it used to look like, particularly with tier two employees who are in a non-contributory plan, but the reason they're in the non-contributory plan is that the state realized they couldn't afford tier one anymore, and it was trying to bait new employees away from tier one into tier two. And then they realized, well, this is not gonna work. We can't do this on a non-contributory basis. So then they created 2A. So the, the, the evolution of thinking around this has occurred. The question is really, like, what do you do about those long-term liabilities and this group of people um, who believe they have an ironclad promise from the state of Connecticut um, for the rest of their lives? It's a human question. It's not just math. Um, and so, Katie, knowing that we have all of the, these fixed costs, including the pensions, what can schools and municipalities expect um, this year from lawmakers? What can they expect? I know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I start getting calls sometime in the fall with superintendents asking me, how much money should I budget for next school year? And I say, it's really very early for me to be able to tell what the budget yes. is going to look like. Um, so. Uh, the good news is that we got some positive looking consensus revenue numbers yesterday. Yes. And for people who don't know what consensus revenue numbers are, um, that is where the legislature's office of fiscal analysis and the governor's office of policy and management agree on basically how much taxes they think they're going to collect for this year so that we basically know how much income the state has. Uh, those numbers looked pretty good. That's always promising. When they look bad, that's always concerning. So I'm, I'm optimistic that those numbers are looking good. But we still have a very significant budget deficit even with those better looking consensus revenue numbers. So we're, we're now looking about a, at about a billion and a half in the first year of the biennium, still almost $2 billion in the second year of the biennium. Uh, and those are very big budget holes to close when we've already discussed the fact that half of the pie is dedicated to those long-term fixed costs that we need to pay. And I think to Comptroller Lembo's point, the way Connecticut got into so much trouble with their pensions is that they didn't save money to pay them more than a question of what benefits was Connecticut offering. If you promise someone something in the future and you don't save any money now to pay for that later, when that bill comes due, you're going to have a problem. And that is essentially the issue that the state of Connecticut is facing, right? We made a lot of promises, we didn't save any money, and now here we are. Well, the reality of that is a large portion of today's budget is now taken up by these fixed costs. And again, in that non-fixed portion, we have all of the aid that we send to school districts and to municipalities. Um, and that is has downward pressure on it 
as we continue to have these increasing fixed costs. So, um, you know, I, I think unless there's some sort of short-term miracle, we're probably looking at another difficult budget year and another difficult budget cycle uh, for school districts and municipalities through no fault of their own, uh, but certainly something that they're going to have to face as they are thinking about planning their town and school district budgets in the upcoming year. Um, I don't know, Representative Kimbalura may have more of a sense of what they should expect this year than me. Yeah, so I mean, um, you know, Republicans were able to influence some big changes in the state budget in fiscal years 2018 and 2019. Um, were those changes, the volatility cap, the spending cap, the revenue cap, the bonding cap, enough to control state spending? So I, I think we're gonna see that play out okay. in this budget cycle to determine whether or not those caps um, will be honored effectively to help control spending. Um, one of the challenges you know, just a little off topic, but one of the challenges we have right now is session started a little bit later, so the JF deadlines for finance and probes is May 2nd, which many municipal budgets <laughs> are, go are, are going out to referendum in very early May. They already have their budget set, and that's going to compound the problem for cities and towns, um, especially when it comes to education dollars. Um, my concern is, as we're seeing, you know, the student population shrink, the legislature will say, well, there's a reducing population, we can cut education spending. But the reality is that we've underfunded education, in my opinion, in the last 20 years. Um, when I served locally, the state dollars used to make up, in our local budget, almost 30% of our budget. It's now dropped down, I think, to around 18%, because the state has not kept up with the pace of inflation and what we, we should be supporting for education. The bond cap, volatility cap, revenue caps, um, I think were important measures. Some of them are, um, how they're going to be applied are going to be a bit rough for us. When I entered the legislature and I became ranking on finance in 2008, um, I started looking at our pools of money and seeing how capital gains in the state of Connecticut um, brings in a lot more revenue for us than we realized and sometimes masked what was really going on in our economy. So we can have a weak economy, but still the stock market performs well, money comes in and the state would spend it. Um, we would also increase our operating budget at a greater pace because of that stock market trend. And um, Controller Lembo had worked on legislation that was passed, creating this volatility cap, which would take a um, five-year average, it was 10 years, the, a 10-year average smooth it out and that's what we would base our growth on as opposed to basing the gross on, uh, growth of a budget on one year of stock market gain, which could be up to 20%. Um, changes were made, we now have a volatility cap, which is a hard cap on income tax revenue. So anything above 3.15 billion automatically gets siphoned off um, into the rainy day fund. And I think this year we're up around $650 million that's getting taken off the top and putting away in the rainy day fund. The rainy day fund, when it hits 15% of, of the overall budget of being fully funded, which um, I think is probably around 2.5 billion or somewhere in that range, that money then can start being diverted to pay unfunded liabilities, the pension liability, which is important because to me we're looking at failure. You know, if you know, we talk about the promises we made, if we don't pay attention to these unfunded liabilities, eventually we could look at failure and then we really have some severe broken promises. The other cap that was put in place is just a hard bonding cap of about 1.9 billion, so we can't borrow in excess of that. Um, Connecticut has increased its borrowing so much that I remember we were talking about reducing the amount of bonding we do annually but we, we can't even reduce it that much because we need to keep borrowing in order to pay for our indebtedness. Um, so that's gonna have to be gradually done over time. <coughs> um, the third piece is a revenue cap, which is, is roughly, I think next year, it's 99.5% it's of the revenue collected can be spent. That other half a percent needs to be taken off the top. And that decreases over time um, to, in 2026, it's 98% of the revenue can only be included in a budget. Um, and then we have the spending cap, which restricts the amount of expenditures we could have. So there's a lot of restrictions that are put in place right now 
um, for, to control the, the legislature's behavior. And I, I think the good thing about it is it, it is going to make everybody stop and pause, and there needs to be a conscious decision um, before it's made. So if the rainy day fund is Controller Lumbo pointed to, if somebody's gonna look at that to rate it for operational expenses, they need to look at what triggers are in place. Oh wait, it didn't hit the 15% yet, you can't touch it. Oh wait, it's supposed to be earmarked for our pension liabilities, you can't touch it. Why is it earmarked for the pension liabilities? Because this is the amount of our unfunded liabilities. So those triggers are important because you know we're a two year legislative body we need to start paying attention to long term. And so I am hopeful that they will be effective um, going forward in our budgeting process. Go ahead. So, so just real quick, um, so yeah, on the volatility cap, <coughs> it was a significant change. And I don't know why it actually occurred, and maybe sometime somebody can tell me, but we went from what, this, what I'm gonna call this very sophisticated rebasing 10-year machine that sort of looked at revenue and rebased it every year so they knew sort of how much was going to be grabbed and put into the rainy day fund. And it got, this whole big machine got pulled out and they took a hamster in a cage and put it where the engine was and like, and it's a fixed number. It's just, as, as the representative points out, it's this fixed number. And yeah, it can get rebased over time, but it's this sort of clunky old generation way to approach things. And it's gonna have real ramifications. And yeah, we're, up at, we're almost at 10% or we will be at 10% uh, in the rainy day fund, which is great news on that front. But any future changes we make now, either by rating unnecessarily or changing the volatility cap or any of the other caps for that matter, um, then we're suddenly sending another message back out to the, the bond community, the rating agencies, and saying, yeah, that thing we said we were gonna do to be more responsible, we're, even if it was the wrong thing, now we have to figure out like how do we tweak this thing in the spirit of that to not send a horrible message out to the community of people who buy our paper. Um, and you know, help us to keep this whole enterprise uh, moving forward. One of the bits of learning for me, and it was a hard bit of learning because I come from an advocacy background, is I could always say whatever I felt. And I've tried to continue to do that, um, but then I realized shortly after becoming comfortable that other people beyond you are listening, and sometimes it's the rating agencies that are listening, so as I'm like free-forming on like, what should we be doing, I realize I'm sending out bad messages to somebody who's getting very nervous and trying to decide if they're gonna buy our paper or not, uh, our bonds, uh, forward, so I'm trying to be <laughs> <laughs> disciplined. So, well, all of those caps and budget changes seem to have complicated the budget process, so what has your office done uh, to help inform taxpayers about how their money is being spent? So, perhaps, I think the, at the end of the day, you know, I hope if I leave anything, having been in this office, it's it's not going to be the sort of volatility cap. Though I find it very sexy and interesting. <laughs> not many people do. Um, and there are other sort of big things we've done around wrangling pensions and some other things that were, were big work and important work. It's really the transparency thing that I hope is the, the thing that folks will remember because in Open Connecticut, you know, it's open page, uh, open checkbook, it's open payroll, it's open pension, it's all the information that I see every day. As an advocate, I was under this mistaken assumption that once I got into this office, once I got inside government or inside the walls, then all of this great data would be available to me and to others to analyze these things. You know, as a policy wonk and a data nerd, like we, you know, looking at the three of us, you know, we like this stuff. Um, <laughs> but you get inside and you realize that's not the case. There are walls inside, even inside government. Like I was told at one point, no, you can't know how much, you know, what's going on with. Uh, uh, economic development tax credits because they appear on somebody's tax form. It's like, well then how do we measure whether they're effective or not? So there's a lot more work to do inside state government to make sure that we have the information. I, I'm not in, under any illusions that people are like logging on there on a Saturday night with a glass of wine to figure out you know, <laughs> what bills did they pay. I'm logging on there on a Saturday night. <laughs> Most of us are not logging on there on a Saturday <laughs> night. Um, but some people are and academics are, and the media is, and people who take away big chunks of information and do analysis on our behalf, Connecticut government and frankly state governments around the country have gutted their capacity to do this work because when you're in bad budget situations, unless you're a person who moves a thing from here to there in a process, you're, you're deemed you know, unnecessary. 
We need more people who are thinking 10 years out, 20 years out for where we're going to be. Uh, so I hope it's the transparency stuff. And I hope uh, that in as much as it helps uh, to, to set good policy going forward, in as much as it helps hold government accountable going forward, um, the revenue calculator, you know, I'm grateful to Kevin and Brooks for their help in taking something we did and then updating it with all the new tax changes so that all of you can go on and be the finance chair for the day and decide, you know, well, yes, if we do marijuana and tolls or not, or if we do a capital gains change or not, and what is the impact of that, we can have uh, an important conversation and not a cranky uncle conversation. And we've all had the cranky uncle conversation, usually at the dinner table, where you know somebody's going, you know, like, oh, this one did that thing, or this one did that thing, or they're holding up one finger and saying, if you just do this one thing, everything will be fine. Tax the rich, cut the pension, whatever it is. It's not one thing. It's a hundred things. And we have to have serious conversations. And if we're not going to have serious conversations, then you need not be in the conversation. So like, I've reached a point in my life where I'm like, show me who you are, tell me who you are, I promise to believe you, and like, I'm, I'm moving on. Like, we're, we're, we have work to do, and we all have a role to play in this, and uh, I hope folks engage in it. So Katie, your, your organization too has developed some public, um, some public resources to better understand the, the budget process, so just tell us a little bit yeah. about those. So Comptroller Lembo mentioned that, uh, particularly as there's downward pressure on state governments, a lot of that analysis capacity goes away. So the shoes we have tried to fill is providing a lot of that analysis capacity on the outside of government with some great partners in government, like Comptroller Lembo, who have helped us get access to the data we need in order to do that. Um, we display all of that information on two websites. One is www.ctschoolfinance.org and the other one is ctstatefinance.org. Uh, and basically one of the things we've done is we've gone and collected up like a vacuum cleaner all of the data that various <coughs> different state agencies um, and websites spit out. Uh, we have loaded it into some sort of magical BigQuery system um, and then we are able to produce all kinds of data visualizations and analysis uh, about how the state is spending their money, about what our pension liabilities look like, about education funding, uh, and display all of that so that it's available to the public so that they can go on there and take a look and try to more easily understand what's happening and hopefully develop well thought out positions and solutions to some of the challenges that the state's facing. And I, I think the towns are very um, thankful that you uh, provided the, the ECS data um, you know, as soon as any of the budgets come out. Um, that's very useful. You know obviously to them, and I didn't actually realize until you said it that um, May 2nd is the, like the JF deadline for finance and appropriations, which is really late, which is really gonna put towns in a, in a bad situation uh, this year. Um, so, uh, Representative Candelora, I'm gonna ask you a political question. <laughs> so, now that you're firmly in the minority, how much influence um, or what pressure can you exert over the budget process this year? So I, I think, you know, it was a very interesting process over the last two years. Um, you know, I've been involved with the budget for the past 10 years at, at certain levels. Um, and I think in the building you create relationships regardless of what your party affiliation is. Um, when we talk about transparency, um, you know, I, I like numbers. And when I was put onto finance, I was trying to dig down on things. And it was amazing to me that we never had cash flow reports, so that the legislature has never given um, what's in our checkbooks and how it's how it works. And Connecticut has a very unique system from other states, all the money is thrown into one pot. And I remember <coughs> um, it was right toward the end of submitting bills and I couldn't get the information from the treasurer's office. And then it dawned on me, I'll put in legislation and require it. Um, and it was working with the other side of the aisle and explaining it, it was uh, Senator Daly at the time, who was chairman of the finance, looked at this and said, you know, this is good information that we really need to have and understand. And we were able to pass that legislation in a bipartisan effort. And I think that incrementally changed the way the legislature looked at the budget process. Because it wasn't just the numbers on the paper, but it's also what you have in your, your bank account um, and those impacts. And, um, you know, as we move forward, the budget process obviously is the most political piece and it, it tends to get, um, you know, very partisan. You know, in part, I think, is both parties philosophically have very different views on, on how spending and taxation should work. Uh, but last year, we were faced with the situation of a complete impasse. Um, 
Democrats still had the majority in the House, they had the governor's office, and they had a tie in the Senate, but effectively with um, Governor Wyman's vote, you know, they controlled the Senate as well, but couldn't get the votes together to pass a budget. And it was an opportunity for Republicans to step up and say, we'll, we'll offer some votes on the budget. Um, it's one saying all the time, when you're, you're trying to get something in the budget or negotiated, a Democrat will say to you, well, are you gonna vote for the budget? You know, if you're not gonna put skin in the game, why should you be part of it? And I understand that, that concept. But the Republicans did step, step up, and we had a lot of ideas that we wanted to see happen in that budget. The first was we can't increase taxes. Um, and those ground rules were adhered to. And both parties worked together um, to craft a bipartisan budget. And I think it was a positive thing for the state of Connecticut. Unfortunately, people's memories are short, and they don't realize when we were in that room, you know, towns were, uh, their bond ratings were going down, towns were running out of money for education dollars. It was a real dire situation. If Republicans dug in, you would have saw the apocalypse. Um, and maybe the election outcome would have been different in November, and Democrats would have gotten blamed, similar to the game that we're seeing going on in, in, at the federal level. Um, and I have to say, neither side thought that was a good idea. And we, and we stepped up and negotiated the budget. Um, there, w there was recently a, a Democrat, I won't call him out, but had called me up and had said, you know, I really want to continue working with you on the budget and have it be a bipartisan process because we put things in that budget that we never would have been able to do with just one party decision making. And I think that was the most important takeaway that I hope people in the building realize. When you have that give and take, from two parties that have very different views, there, there does have to be compromise, um, but, but you're also putting yourself out there and you're gonna get support and votes for things that you wouldn't necessarily wanna go out and vote for. Um, so votes were taken that politically might not have been the best thing for my district, um, but on the other hand, there could be a city legislator that was in that room voting for that budget that wasn't all politically good for their district either, but getting it together and taking that vote together um, sort of gives you, you cover in the building, and I think we put out our best product. And it's part of why I think we are seeing this revenue that is coming in and going to the rainy day fund. We've had we have the largest rainy day fund that we've ever had in history. Um, and I think that's important to help the rating agencies and, and put us on the right track. People that see that, I think, hopefully will continue to be able to work together in a bipartisan effort. So I am hopeful that will continue. And Governor Lamont did say that fixing the budget requires a bigger table and an open door, and I'm ready to listen to any good idea, and I will take heat and share credit, and the budget vote will be tough, no doubt. It'll be easy to vote no, but I have the responsibility to get us to yes, and we only get there by working together. So that, that seems to be a hopeful sign. From budget creation, right? So it's not just like you know, let's okay, here, here it is. Ta -da. We always talk about the ta-da moment where a governor, you know, appears and says, ta-da, here's my budget. It's been a secret up to now, but here it is. They seem to be approaching this in a very different way. You know, 400 people in a room talking about like, okay, well, what about this and what about that and how do we manage this? That input going up and not just two guys on a sales pitch tour like trying to convince people to vote for it, but rather feeling like they've had input into it. Um, on its face, far different and much better, I think, or a better product uh, at the other end. And, and I'm hopeful that both sides can be together and work together and compromise a little bit where they can and need to, still retain their own set of values, but find those places where in the common interest it makes sense to move a little bit, uh, we'll all be better off for it. And there's evidence that it can occur. Um, so we're getting to the point where we're going to begin uh, taking audience questions. So. Um, Pass your, pass your cards to Ellen and, and she'll collect them. And, and so um, I'm gonna ask a question about uh, some of the, the pension discussion that we had uh, last week with the School Finance Project. Are there opportunities to securitize state assets and is that one of the solutions that we need to be considering? Is that a short-term or, or a long-term solution? 
Uh, so it's certainly a solution that we should be discussing. So securitizing assets for pension systems is a pretty new idea. This isn't something that has gone on a lot of places around the country. Um, so I think it's a really important thing for the state to look at. I think that there are sort of two pieces to that. One, there's the question of identifying what assets does the state have that can be that can actually be securitized. States are unique. They're not companies. They don't have the same kinds of assets uh, that a corporation might have in this kind of a situation. So in order for that plan to, to be viable, you have to be able to um, determine what assets does the state have that can actually be monetized, valued, um, and, and, and put into a security trust. And I think that that is a challenge. And there's also the issue of sort of how does that transaction get structured? Um, I think that there are opportunities there and that that's something that the state should be look, looking at. I do want to caution that that is not going to solve the problem. So um, securitizing assets could potentially be part of the solution. Um, I'm a little bit concerned at the volume I am hearing uh, this as a potential solution and, and a little worried that people think, oh, you know, we're going to figure out some assets, we're going to take the lotto, we're going to move it into the pension system, and then everything is going to be all set and no more problems and we can move on. That is certainly not going to be the case. There's not enough assets out there uh, that the state has that that would be possible. So um, certainly, uh, and, and without getting into this, there are some complexities around some pension obligation bonds and the teacher's pension. There's the possibility that uh, securitizing some assets may help to deal with some specific challenges presented by those POBs. And, and if there's an opportunity to do that, it's certainly worth looking at. But I don't want people to take you know, their, their eye off the ball and put it on asset securitization and think, aha, we found the solution. We don't have to do anything hard. We're still going to have to do hard things. And, and so we hear a lot about, so this question to anybody, we hear a lot about Connecticut's priorities as a state and how we must protect the most vulnerable. How does the state protect safety net services when the state also faces the additional expenses as a result of litigation from violations of, of people's rights to some extent? There are some. What does it say about us that the way to finally protect a class of people or a group of people, particularly vulnerable folks, is to sue the state and get a consent decree because then you know you'll get a locked in budget item for, I mean, this is where we, where we are, that they, as a strategy, that is the best after you've banged your head against the door trying to make the case that with real data, you can prove you're avoiding longer term expenses, you're making people's lives better if you make the investment on the front end. So that's fine for values, that's fine as a talking point, uh, but how do you make the room? I think the way you make the room is you, you bring that predictability, you squeeze down those liabilities as best you can, you make, keep your obligations as best you can, you free up the difference in the meantime, and as ever, the growth piece of this has to be factored in, but not in a way that we're either surprised by it or we're counting on it. Right? We, we should assume some level of growth as things move forward. I think it's fair to budget in for some of that growth over time, but let's not get too sort of ambitious about what that's going to look like because you just create another hole. One of the ways over the years that Connecticut has messed around with the budget is, not, is well, two ways. One is hiding expenses, <coughs> and the other is inflating <coughs> revenue. And that made it look balanced on the day that it was passed. And a lot of people knew that that was happening, but figured, well, growth will take care of this and everything will be fine. And then it didn't. Uh, and then you spiral from there into not being able to meet your obligations. I, I, think, I think that the, um, you know, especially the development, developmentally disabled community sort of made this more three-dimensional. It's made our jobs a lot harder in the sense that the decision-making has real impact. Um, when I served locally, you couldn't go to the grocery store without being hounded. Coming up here, there was a level of anonymity, and you're almost not held as accountable um, in your decision making because people don't really know what's going on. And because we've seen the squeeze on the budget, there is a, a greater community, more of a community out there um, that's advocating for their positions. And I think it is important for all of us to listen, and I think we've done a good job the last budget was stored a lot of proposed cuts um, to different safety net areas, um, and we tried to do a good job, that's why it took seven months to negotiate, literally going through and understanding each program um, and not looking at it as just a line item reduction on a piece of paper. And I think that's important to con continue that process. Um, and and I, I think, you know, generally, um, 
getting my second point out. I'll remember when I come back. But I, I just think it, it's important to listen to these individuals um, when, when we are going through that process. Will those things be at risk again this year? I mean, the Medicare Savings Program, um, Husky A, A parents? Uh, well, I, I think they all always are at risk. And I'll, I'll give a point to how it could be at risk in a very interesting and direct way. But we're hearing this proposal on minimum wage increase to $15. And it's a great sound bite, and everybody wants a $15 minimum wage increase. That's going to impact everybody's Husky benefits um, and the, or their Medicaid benefits because it bumps them up over um, the income qualifications. Last year for PCAs, we increased the, the, the pay to $14.75 an hour and also for the home health care workers. Th those individuals that were working in those positions all lost their health care. And then the agencies are scrambling and how to provide that to them. So we have to be very careful um, in what we're doing because you know we've pushed things down so far that every decision is going to have an impact somewhere else. So we might be saving on Medicaid dollars by not having to pay these people, but we're kicking this segment of society off. And they might be getting more in their paycheck, but they're losing a very significant, important safety net. Um, I think the one thing that I would add to this is um, I think that the, the advocacy community also <coughs> has a responsibility to make sure that within whatever area they're working on, they're identifying the programs that are most effectively serving people and then advocating to the legislature that those programs be funded. It's hard for legislators to know the intimate details of every type of program um, that the state pays for, but the folks who work within advocacy communities generally do know that. On the education side, people who work in education know that not every program that the state funds works equally well in, in improving opportunities for our highest need kids, for example. They do know that some work better than others, and I think highlighting those programs to the legislature and to the extent we have limited resources, making sure that they're going into those programs that those advocates know really have the greatest effect is at least one way to try to help leverage the limited dollars we do have um, to, to serve communities as best we can. And just to add, um, you know, in 2021, the CBAC agreement, the, the way it's written, we're going to see people retire um, in order to get the maximum amount of benefits for themselves. There's an opportunity there. So some areas of uh, government, we provide you know, behavioral health services. The private sector may be able to do a much better job at a more effective cost level. And so there could be opportunities around the horizon to shift more to a private sector delivery model um, and, and move away from government services. Connecticut is one of the few that provides that dual service. Um, and, and part of the problem, I think, of us moving in that direction has been the union contracts. But as we see attrition, there might be an opportunity. So, so let me ask you, what areas of government make sense then to privatize and which don't? Well, I think as I just pointed out, that the, the one area of behavioral health, um, EH care uh, in my service area does a phenomenal job on much less resources than the state provides. That's an area that I think that the state can get out of. The other area that was talked about um, is even just contracting. There's certain, through our, you know, this is a smaller thing, but I think we need to look at every penny. But when you're, when you're applying for um, a construction project, you know, there's certain permits that you need to obtain. You have private engineers that are signing off on your, uh, on your applications. It's then given to the state for review. What's happened um, is it, it sits on a desk and it waits nine months or a year for those approvals to be had. There could be a process, the expertise is in the private market, that they could be signing off on those um, applications, working in partnership as opposed to um, you know, having a, a bureaucratic office doing that type of work. Um, and I think Florida has done some of that stuff, and I think that's a model that we, we should take a look at as well. I mean, I get, I get concerned, uh, not just because of the employees who may or may not be employed by the state going forward. I think that's something to consider. Um, when I look at the workforce today, it is significantly lower uh, than it was eight years ago, like by a lot, and I'm blanking on the number right now, but significantly fewer people doing the work. But that doesn't mean anything on its face, because if you don't re-engineer what's happening, then you just have fewer people doing, you know, doing the job, and that just leads to inefficiency and frustration on the part of consumers and that whole bit. Historically, 
states, and Connecticut is a prime example, got into the privatization game little bits here and there, and but there wasn't adequate oversight. So they sort of rolled things out into the community, said the private sector is going to solve everything, and then we're just going to like back up and like let it all happen. And then the train started wrecking all over the place, and then the state had to come back in and either pull it back in. If we're going to do anything around rolling things out into the private sector, there's got to be good oversight, and there's a cost to that oversight. And it means intrusion into the private sector, and they don't always like that. And so we have to be really clear about what that means. It is incumbent on all of us, public or private, to both have an apples-to-apples -apples conversation, which doesn't often happen. You got to make sure you're really comparing all of this to all of that before you figure out if you're actually going to save money. Um, and that we build our own value proposition, that we all have our own value proposition. This is the value of doing it this way. This is the value I bring to the table. Um, that's an important conversation to have. And inside state government needs to be part of what the new administration does, and I hope the last administration would do, and that is the agency by agency, function by function, and some of you will probably roll your eyes because I've been saying this for eight years, analysis of what do you do, why do you do it, what's the constitutional or statutory underpinning to what you do, and then put things in buckets, must do, want to do, and that helps you then figure out, okay, what does this enterprise actually look like and how does it, how should it operate? Um, I think it's easy sometimes, and I'm not saying that that's like what's happening here, to just th say that privatization is going to like, make things cheaper, better, faster. Um, sometimes private sector learns from government as well. And we need to have a government that we, need to, that we can be proud of and that others will follow what we're doing. And I am hopeful and optimistic uh, about where we can be on this. But has, has it worked, at, I mean, at the DMV? The DMV, obviously, the AAA services, the licensing. Sure, and the, it seems to have worked. Uh, yeah, I think, bank. you know, that's a good, that. good example where AAA, people love going there for their license. Right. And I'm now driving a trauma or a saver, unfortunately, <laughs> because New Haven no longer has that service contract. And that's a problem. But one of the problems with the state of Connecticut is we don't even have the conversation. So in the CBAC agreement, we have a flat prohibition on privatization. So you don't even hear a bill or a subject matter come up to even discuss this. And we sit here and we have software training school that millions and millions of dollars have been spent annually. And part of that is why? Because the unions fight and dig their ground in and say, we're not giving up our jobs and we're not gonna have the conversation. So you sit back and the alternative is failure. Um, you know, just recently when we're seeing with the government shutdown, the breath of fresh air is, you know, Senator Blumenthal came out and said, let's use the unemployment compensation fund to try to take care of these workers. That suggestion is somewhat problematic because the private sector pays into that fund and it's already underfunded. It's not a great option. But Governor Lamont looked to the private sector and said, we're gonna work with our banks and provide loans to help these individuals for this period of time to get them through until they get their paychecks retroactively. That's a private-public partnership that potentially could work for the state of Connecticut. And we're finally starting to have that dialogue. We've not had that dialogue for, since I've been in the legislature. And, and that's what I think is important. I agree, not every service should be privatized. But, but we should be talking about what areas. And that's why you know, I bring up the behavioral health piece, because you know, I think that's an area that's fair game to talk about. Um, so I have actually two questions which touch on, on the same topic. Um, so the questions are, if unions feel they've already given their fair share, what can incentivize them to come back to the negotiating table? And are there any legal, realistic, humane changes the state can make to retiree health? Um, that would achieve significant structural changes going forward. I'll start with the second one and then I'll, uh, so uh, big changes in the last year in retiree health. So uh, when I first became comptroller, we identified that we weren't maximizing Medicare for our Medicare eligible retirees on the pharmacy side. <coughs> and that was like an $80 million <coughs> annual benefit to our fund by maximizing Medicare. and was right, we didn't need to open the collective bargaining agreement to do it, we were able to sit down until we stipulated an agreement get there, and, and it worked very well. My experience has been with things like that, if you get to the table and hammer it out, you can actually save real money. 
uh, in the short term. Um, Medicare Advantage is another one of those things. So that's 130 million or 160, 130 million a year uh, in annual savings year over year over year by moving our Medicare eligible retirees uh, into that Medicare Advantage plan. Feedback has been good so far. There's been very low member abrasion. People are getting actually, in some cases, an enhanced benefit. Um, and uh, I, I think it's working well. Uh, teachers are now, they've moved uh, to a Medicare Advantage plan. I don't know how that's going. I have to ask some retired teachers. I'm sure they'll be happy to tell me. Um, but I think there's opportunity like that. Uh, and it saves money. Uh, and with the right monitoring, uh, actually is a good thing uh, for the program. So what can get the unions back to the table? Is there, is well, there anything aside from extending the contract, which seems to be the go-to? Right, I mean, and that's sort of the, the problem. I don't think there would be any support um, in the Republican caucuses to continue to extend out these, these long-term agreements. And I'm not sure what gets them to the table. It's, it's why it was a partisan vote, but every Republican voted against that CBAC agreement because that it, it was a long-term agreement with a no layoff clause. Um, so bringing that to the table, there really isn't an, an incentive. Back in 08, when the bottom had dropped out, Governor Rell was able to get them to the table because layoffs were the only alternative. Um, I mean, hopefully we, we, we all recognize, I think to control Lembo's point, there are savings that could be further achieved um, without necessarily them, them being concessions in the sense that it's gonna hurt somebody's out-of-pocket dollars. And I think those are some areas to look. Um, some of the areas that we had proposed last year is you could make some changes to pension benefits that are in the out years that don't affect current employees but would affect new hires. Um, in order to provide more savings. That may be another way to, to have that conversation and, and provide savings um, you know, actuarially this year in the budget. And just to make sure this point isn't lost, we've talked a lot about the state employee pension plan today, but there is a second very large retirement plan in Connecticut, which is the teacher's retirement system, which is a, a totally different plan, totally different animal uh, than the state employee retirement system. And the last legislature, did a lot of work on the state employee retirement system. That's not me taking a position on whether or not I think there's more to do. But on the, the teacher's retirement system side, there are very significant challenges there, climbing um, state more payments immediate. into that plan. It's a more immediate issue uh, that, that the state has not yet t really addressed. Um, and I don't want that to get lost in this and have everyone thinking, oh, this is just like a state employee union problem. Uh, on the teacher's plan side, and, and some of those changes without getting into details are not necessarily about changing benefits for teachers, but dealing with reamortizing the plan and, and, and other types of sort of accounting and, and, and the length of time type changes um, that, that likely at, at a very minimum need to be looked at and thought about. So as we're thinking about these climbing uh, pension obligations, we need to keep in mind that there's more than one pension system mm -hmm. um, and that they, they are different, they have different rules, and they have different issues, and we need to look at them both individually. It, and it makes no sense to continue to do things the way we're doing them as well. There are efficiencies even within the administration of these uh, benefits that could be realized and should be realized. The fact that TRB, the Teachers Retirement Board and the Teachers Retirement System, is operating on an independent platform you know, for their calculations and checks and all of that, when we've spent millions and millions and millions of dollars to have the, the state-of-the-art sort of pension calculating system at, at, at the moment it went into place in the country. So like, why is that sitting out there doing an independent thing when we've got this and we can take advantage of that? Why are we buying healthcare still in different ways? Like they're off doing their own sort of RFPs. We're bigger and frankly, we've got more tools why are we not, I'm not saying take over their purchasing, but forcing a collaboration on purchasing of healthcare and best practice and all of that between these two, and then include workers' comp as well. I mean, they're off there buying healthcare as well, and the EAP for state employees is doing their thing sort of independently as well. None of that makes sense. There, there are things in efficiency that we can bring together, and it's not the job jar. It's real savings and better product at the end of the day. So this is interesting, and I'd actually forgotten about this, but. Um Former OPM Secretary Ben Barnes said that in December that there were two major obstacles to Connecticut's fiscal stability, and one of those is municipalities. Um, he said that legislators need to look at the state as a whole, not just the town, um, that we're spending money on communities that, that have an, enough. 
so some of the, the wealthier um, communities. So how do we get local governments and state lawmakers to, to get this message to voters? It's almost you know, where you have to have a state lawmaker vote against their own well, town and self-interest in, for yeah. the greater good of the state. You, you saw that happen when the ECS formula was implemented. I didn't want to have to go there, but uh, I'll help myself. Um, and I was very honest with my towns, but th that ECS formula, it's a real formula. It's based on um, the number of students, their demographic background, and, and, and so there are legislators that voted that in the long term, with declining populations in my community, they're going to receive less education dollars from the state. Um, and that's that only happens when there's bipartisan cooperation. Um, and all of us had skin in the game, and so you, you, you did see that. And, and hopefully, you know, going forward, we'll continue. But the one thing I do take issue with is, you know, 95% of the education dollars go to our cities. So these wealthy communities. 70%. Oh, it's 70%. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, it depends. If, if, the, the wealthy communities, though, it's much smaller. When you talk about the Darians and the Madisons of the world, they're receiving very, very little education dollars. Um, you know, my community, North Brantford, is getting around 4.5 million. Madison might be 150,000. Um, and we could say, well, they could afford it. But what are we saying to our communities as a town that they're going to put all these money, this money into the state of Connecticut and we're going to give you nothing back for education. But then we're going to mandate that you do X, Y, and Z. And my concern, what we're already seeing is, um, these communities are looking to get out from under the state mandate. So we're going to have a bifurcated education system, and the achievement gap is only going to grow. Um, I think all these communities need to be in, in the game and have skin in the game. You know, what happens to open choice if, if our communities are no longer, you know, certain suburbs are no longer getting education dollars? Are they still going to invest in open choice in our cities? And so that's the broader conversation I think we always need to pay attention to. And, and I, I don't think, frankly, our, our past governor did a good job of that. It, it, we, end, we end up pitting communities against each other. It's the wrong conversation to have. Did anybody? Yeah, yeah so, so to talk about education funding for a minute. So, so it is really challenging in Connecticut when we talk about education funding to have this broader conversation. Right? It, it tends to quickly degrade to a sort of town-by-town -town conversation. Sure. An urban, rural, suburban, but I do give the legislature a lot of credit in 2017 for coming together and really saying, look, we have got to get off the track of not using a formula, formula at all, making arbitrary block grants to towns, not having decreases in aid if you lose <coughs> large amounts of your student population, and that was a really big lift for the legislature. I think on the education funding front, ECS is obviously super important. There are a lot of other components to education funding, including special education funding, our choice programs, which are open choice <laughs> funded differently than ECS. Um, all of those impact our local school districts and how much money they're getting from the state for education funding and education related issues. So I think it is important that people like the last legislature stepped up and did be willing to take this larger look that goes beyond their own town borders. But I think they also need to be able to look at education funding as more than ECS. When we talk about education funding, you know, the first thing legislators tend to do is to go to the town runs, look at their ECS number, is it higher or lower than my ECS number was last year, and that settles the question of whether or not they're in favor of these education funding changes. Um, education funding is more complicated than that. There are more pieces to this system. There, there are other things that are going on that are really important, and we need to move beyond just this question of how much is my ECS funding, is it more or less than last year, that's the end of my education funding conversation to a broader conversation um, that encompasses more of these pieces of education funding and what impacts are on programs like Open Choice and how, how do we incentivize school integration through education funding. And that won't happen until we break out of this box. I think we have to be sensitive to the, like, getting raised, that the, the idea that, like, so what am I paying in versus what am I getting? Um, and I get particularly tweaked around this when I think about it at the federal level. You probably saw last week the sort of the numbers came out about what Connecticut gets back in federal versus others. Oh, and I don't mind that because we're a republic, right? We're supposed to all be supporting one another. Where I get a little tweaked is when they, the donor states, start telling us, I'm sorry, the debtor states start telling the donor states like how to behave. 
like that, I get a little sort of tweaked about that. But then when I pull that thinking to the state level, it's the same kind of thing, right? There are, there are communities that are paying a whole bunch into the state and aren't getting back. And at what point can we sort of examine what the balance is between, well, yes, we're all in this and we pay according to our ability to pay and we should be getting sort of something that meets our community needs somewhere and also a competing argument and that is sort of the Guilford Covenant argument, right? The idea that these people on a boat before they settled in Connecticut were bobbing around on Long Island Sound before they came ashore and they wrote a covenant. And the covenant said, we're gonna land here together, we're gonna stay here together, we're gonna pay according to our ability to pay, pay and we're gonna support one another in our need. Like, how do we balance all of that? We have to have a conversation about what that looks like. Um, and, uh, not, yeah. sorry. No, that's a great, actually, it's that's a great math. place to end. <laughs> it's not bad. That's a great place to end, though. So, um, I wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, we also want to thank Reset for hosting us. Uh, this is where businesses that will help grow Connecticut's economy are born. Um, the forum was streamed uh, live to our Facebook page, and we also have um, uh, the lovely folks from CTN here. Uh, our next forum will be on healthcare cost, quality, and access challenges in Connecticut, and that forum will be Wednesday, February 20th at 10 a.m. It will also be in the space here at Reset. And future forums and planning stages are expected to cover transportation, education, um, seeding uh, the right startups, and the op opioid epidemic. So thank you everybody so much. Hey guys, you shouldn't use the word transparency and dominion.